Welcome back to another Q&A episode of Dealing the Cards. This week, we're going to talk a lot about um, questions related to potential trades this offseason, what kind of payroll they actually need to move, what kind of players will they actually move, uh, what kind of return could they expect on some of their top players, and then also a little bit of conversations about maybe directions in terms of roster building and long-term, what they could go in, and then also like considering the Rob Sir, uh, Sir Folio hire this week, are there any other hires that we can keep an eye on for the Cardinals in a similar vein this offseason? We'll talk about all this and more in this episode of Deal on the Cards. Well, welcome back into another episode of Deal on the Cards. This is our weekly Q&A episode that happens uh, usually on Fridays or Saturdays. Um, and this week, I've got the questions for this, and so I'm excited to dive in. But before we jump in, like and subscribe helps the channel out a ton. Uh, most of our viewers are watching are not subscribed, right? You guys tune in for Cardinal content. Maybe this is your first time tuning in or you've jumped on over. And again, if you want this consistently in your feed, we go live twice a week. We have a Q&A episode. Um, every other week, we've got uh, prospect episodes. Um, we've got some really awesome guests lined up for next week. So really excited about that. Let's talk more about the off season. But yeah, like this video now if you're listening. Subscribe to the channel. It helps us out a ton. Share. We're getting close to 3K subs. And I'm sure we'll do another giveaway at that point too. Um, and then comment down below as you're listening to the episode, any question that you have or just thoughts on my responses to some of your questions from this past week. So the first question today, um, I'll just kind of read for, uh, mostly for Vadum, but I'll kind of get through it. But, um, the question was, I don't understand how trading Arnado Gray, Michaelis Matz is getting money off the books. Basically the question was talking about if you have to pay part of their salary to move on from them, does it really make sense to move them at that cost? And then there was also part of that question was like, why would you trade Contreras when he's a great bat, clubhouse leader, affordable price? <clears throat> uh, working in reverse order a little bit here, like Contreras, totally agree with that. Like he is, seems like to be one of the leaders in the clubhouse. Excellent bat, top 10 right handed bat in all of baseball over the last few years. And that's not just me being anecdotal there. Go look at the numbers. And he's a catcher doing that too. So imagine. I mean, just the production from catcher alone is incredible. But then even if you moved from the first base or DH, that bat plays. And at 18 million, that's worth it for sure. Um, but that's part of what makes him a good trade candidate is he could actually get you something in return. I'm talking about a guy who's getting closer to his mid-30s than his early 30s at this point. You've got other catching options. By the time the Cardinals are, even if it's 2026, I mean, maybe Contreras is great in 2026, but you're probably going to start seeing him tail off 2027, 2028. So you capitalize on that value now when you have any Von Herrera, Pedro Pais, Jimmy Crooks, Leonardo Bernal, you're going youth movement. It makes sense. Um, but then to the point of like moving money off the books. So it's kind of go piece by piece here. Like Arenado, his money's actually declining year to year. Yeah, I'm sure you'd have to eat money on it, but I don't think it's a crazy amount of money either because I think he's 28 million next year, 20 to the year after and then 15 the year after that and that's baking in the money that colorado's already paying it's not crazy at all and so yes you're gonna have to pay down some of it but you're still saving like let's say they pay down like 20 percent of it well you're saving 80 percent of that contract that's that's money being saved it's not like you're eating the entire deal same with gray i don't think you're eating the entire deal there um if you want to get even a even better return i think you do eat some of that money but again is that five ten million fifteen million like well, then you're still saving like 45 million in the process. So again, saving money there. Um, Matt's, I think you're eating a couple million. I don't think you're eating like he's due to 11 and half, 12 and a half million next year. I don't think you're eating 8 million of that. Maybe you are. Um, but then again, it's still, you're still saving that for. Um, but a guy like Michaelis to me is one where I actually am not totally sure. Uh, actually, I'll get back to that. But yeah, if you even if you Michaelis, I think you're eating most of that contract. But the point is, even if you eat, money off of each of these deals the net total that you're saving will be more than what you're sending out if you're going youth movement makes sense again gray and arnado both or arnado is three years left gray is two years left with the cl uh, club option Matt's has one year michaelis has one year Contreras is three years so you're also not talking about like an eight-year deal that you're having to eat money on every year um i think it makes sense to move off these um or can make sense to move off these um, if they're trying to save money, but more importantly, I think it's about getting the return and what's the timeline for this team, right? Like 2025, it, again, I think they've pretty much written it off at this point. I mean, they're not opposed to contending, but they're not necessarily putting all the chips in. 
they think they can contend next year in some world, then maybe you keep some of those guys. If 2026 is a realistic contending year, not just like get back to being pretty good, but like a postseason threat, then maybe again, you keep some of those guys around. So um, I'm going to go to this other question that's related to it and then get into a little bit more of some returns. So um, related to this question was one that said, we are all expecting them to move a lot of players, but I think probably just a couple will leave. Probably fair, but maybe not. Um, maybe one of Michaelis and Matt's, one of the catchers. I may be wrong, but I just don't see as much turnover as people anticipating. Also, Helsley might be gone, which brings up the question of who do you see closing next year? So again, I think you're right in terms of it's possible that we only see a few names moved. If I'm being honest right now, I think you do see some of the bigger names moved, and it's actually less likely that you see a Miles Michaelis moved, for example. And I've, I've written about or wrote about this, and I think it goes live on Friday on Red Bird Rants. Maybe it's on Saturday, but just this idea that, like, if they end up moving a lot of that money we just talked about earlier, and a lot of those players we just talked about earlier, like for the rotation, for example, let's say they decline the options of Lyndon Gibson. Let's say they move on from one of Gray or Matt. So let's just say Matt's here. Let's say they even keep Gray. Well, then you have Gray, Fetty, Palante, McGreevy. After that, you don't have anyone. Like, Quinn Matthews could be in the rotation, but you're not going to force him into that yet. Um, again, uh, Semmer Bursa could be. Matthew Libertor could be. Gorgon Graceffo could be. But you shouldn't have to force those guys in those roles. And then injuries happen, too. And so, like, very quickly, even if you're like, oh, well, only one of them has to earn the spot, well, one injury happens like, well, now we need two of them to start. And I think it makes sense to keep if you're again, if 20, if winning's not the objective in 2025 to the first point of like, well, are you really saving money? Like you need someone to pitch. And like if you're if Matt and Michael is an example of someone you're going to eat most of the contract and not get anything in return, like Gray and Contreras, you're eating money potentially, but you're getting good things back. Michael you're not getting good things back. So why not just keep them and throw them um, in this scenario? So I actually think to this this listener's point, like yeah, there are scenarios where only a couple leave, um, but I do think it's pro not quite a full fire sale of these guys. But I do think you see a lot of guys move. So if I just had to guess right now, for sure Helsley, I think Fetty makes a lot of sense to move because again he has a value, and you're not going to have to eat that money either um, because of how val like valuable that contract is. Um, I think Contreras is gone, um, and I kind of think Gray's gone, and maybe Arenado. Um, but I kind of think Michael stays. Matt's kind of could go either way. Um, I don't see at this point then like Herrera being moved or guys like that because it's the youth movement side of things. So, um, but yeah, we'll see. I mean, we, we'll get some more clarity here in the near future. Um, question about kind of returns on what they could get in some of their deals. Um, this will be kind of a quick answer to this. But the question was, do you think they could get up? I'm guessing they meant Jackson Holiday or a top bat for a package of Gray and Helsley. I've thought about that type of package. Um, no to Jackson Holiday for sure. Um, like Gray and Helsley packaged together to like a team like Baltimore. I mean, it probably raises the ceiling of the type of prospect you can get, but it's probably like, do I don't know if the Cardinals trade them together to get like one top prospect with a couple other guys. Like I think they'd rather trade them separately and get strong, like pretty strong packages for both of them but maybe not as quite of a high ceiling guy. Um, but I, again, I could be wrong on that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think they'll end up being packaged together. I could be wrong, I think, but I think you're going to see Helsley shop to all teams in baseball, and it's going to be go to the highest bidder, and Gray's probably going to be more centric to teams that are in his trade clause, like who he'll approve. Again, that could be Baltimore, and then maybe that's how the Helsley thing gets on there. Um, but I don't necessarily, I'm not going to bank on them being packaged together. And then it's kind of hard to assess, like, how do you or how do you uh, give value to a deal that has both guys in it? So I think they'll be separated. But um, before we get into more questions, just want to thank three on four sports cards and collectibles. They've been an awesome sponsor of the podcast. I really want to highlight today checking them out on Instagram as well as in their Instagram bio. They have a live auction link where they go live on there consistently selling um, cards while they're on there. But if you go and visit three on four in person, uh, you can buy, sell, and trade all sports cards and Pokemon cards. They've got boxes, packs, single-player cards, Pokemon cards, all that kind of stuff that you can get from 314. Many of you already checked them out, which is awesome, so make sure you let 314 know if you if you found out about them from the podcast and you're coming in from that. Um, Andrew's been ripping a lot of cards on here lately, which has been super fun, and um, 314 has been a great 
um, partner for this podcast. So we really appreciate their support, but then also it's just fun to get into the trading cards. So um, that's your thing, or you're looking to get into it, check out 314, and they'd love to hook you up with some good cards and deals. Um, well, let's continue on a little bit here. So um, another question kind of related, and I, I've talked about this before, but someone asked about why do people want to turn Ryan Helsley into a starter? Um, just frankly, I think he's got plenty of talent. He's got the build for it. Again, he was in the minor leagues as a starter. Cardinals transitioned to do a reliever, not because he failed as a starter, but because they needed a reliever, and then he was good at it, and they kept him in it. Um, what's more valuable, a lockdown closer or even a number two starter, number three starter, probably the number two, or definitely number two starter, probably number three starter. Like, I don't even think Hels or Helsley was even worth three war this year, and like a good like Eric Fetty was worth four more war than him. <laughs> like, like, I think Ryan Helsley could be an excellent starter. And then worst case scenario, like obviously injury is always worst case scenario, but he could easily get injured as a reliever. Like being the starter, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's a lot out there that tells us that being a like starting is going to for sure get you um into more injury situations than uh, being on the bullpen because i mean you're on a consistent rhythm at that point and i see i don't think he's gonna be a guy that like go eight innings right he's probably more the six inning maybe seven inning guy like sunny gray style um he's a wicked slider it's better than his fastball and his fastball is incredible he's got a change up he can go to um, he's had a curveball in the past that if he really, if he wanted to be a starter, he had to reintegrate that. But he's got all the tools. And then again, worst case, let's say he just gets smashed as a starter. Well, I don't really think Ryan Hills is going to have trouble transitioning back to the bullpen. But at this point, it's a lost cause. They're not going to do it. You trade him. That's the best thing to do at this point. Um, and then they asked, they, they thought Arnaud was going to request a trade, um, which I think makes a lot of sense. Um, and then yeah, Gray's contract is going to cost a lot of money. So yes, I, and also I think he's probably going to want to contend somewhere. Um, I, they want to keep Contreras, but I don't know if Contreras is going to stay here, honestly, but who knows again, this is, we're all speculating right now. None of us really for sure know what's going on with this. So we'll see. Um, just two more questions left today. It's a little bit of a shorter one, but, um, again, I think at this point we're, I mean, it's a good thing. I like that we're addressing, a lot of similar topics from different angles. Um, or maybe you've missed the Q&A, so you're, you're wondering some things that maybe we've addressed before. But one of the newer pieces of news, and then over the next few weeks, we'll start getting more new news. But one of the newer pieces of news that we got recently was the Rob um, Serfolio hire from Heim Bloom, And he will be the assistant GM who oversees player development. Oh my gosh, I'm forgetting the other side of it too. But basically the farm system and player development and he's going to hire a farm director and a director of um gosh why am i blanking on the other side of his title right now but anyways um it's a significant hire it comes over from cleveland spent nine years there three years as their farm director again cleveland consistently has one of the better um farm systems in all baseball consistently contends on a low payroll i think they've had 690 win season since 2015 one 100 win season one, one trip to the World Series, two trips to the ALCS, fourth best winning percentage over that stretch. They're a good organization. Um, so what other types could they bring in like that, like Heimblum? Um, I Honestly, it's hard to pin that down. Like I don't have, I'm not, I don't know of names right now specifically they're looking at for the farm director role. Um, that's something that we'll see as the days and weeks go on for sure. Um, that's, they said upon the hire of Serfolio that one of the first things he's going to start doing right away is looking into who, like, like what's their, like, he's going to be the guy that's overseeing the next hires. Um, but I'm sure Bloom will have a significant role in that as well. And so will, uh, John Mozilla, but yeah, he is, uh, Serfolio is going to look for the farm director and director of performance. And what I really enjoy that I don't think has been talked about enough with the Bloom hiring Serfolio here is the Cardinals just big picture have gotten into trouble with a lot of retreads and hiring familiar faces, right? Like the front office is full of people who've been around for a while. It's come up through the organization. It's gotten promotions. That's a good thing, but like, it's not a good thing when that's all you have. It's just the same voices that think the same, know the same, that grew up in the same system. Like it's basically an echo chamber at that point. And they lacked innovation. They fell behind the times. 
Bloom talked about in his opening press conference that if you rest on your laurels in this league, you get beat. So what I really like about this Bloom hire, again, is it's obviously an outside voice, but also he didn't even retread there, right? He didn't go, and I'm not talking about a Cardinal retread. I'm talking about Bloom didn't even just go like, oh, who's someone I know from Boston or Tampa? Which I think if he would have done that, a lot of us would have been like, oh, that's awesome. Like he comes from, he's cut from the same cloth. We like that hire. Like I'm saying, like I probably would have been like, oh, sweet. Like Bloom must have thought this guy was really good when they worked together. I like this way more because Bloom looking at the landscape of baseball is like, who is really good at player development? I'm really good at it. Come from organizations that are really good at it, but there's other organizations that are really good at it too. And we need to continue to grow and evolve. And I want to learn from what Cleveland's doing. I think this Serfolio guy has what it takes to lead this. I'm going to go poach him from Cleveland. I'm going to offer him a bigger role. I'm going to create a new layer of leadership here in St. Louis. I'm going to compensate this guy enough that he's going to turn down other jobs and he's going to leave a really good situation in Cleveland to come to St. Louis. And he isn't just a guy he knew already. I like this. I think it's another example. Of, I think it's a or a, one of the first examples where we've heard of this anecdotally, but it's like a real example now of Bloom looking far and wide across baseball, looking for people who are vetting the systems, figuring out who's really good at what they do right now, and going after them, right? And and being willing to innovate and change. And him and Serfolio are going to work together this next year on the player development side of things, right? Because next year, Heim Bloom's going to be charged with baseball development, so he can't just be all things player development all the way, all the time. So Serfolio and him are going to work together overhaul this year, but then it's going to be Serfolio's baby to oversee. Obviously, Bloom's going to still have a significant role in it, it's for sure, but like Serfolio is going to be in charge of managing the farm director, the director of performance, and everyone underneath them and making sure player development's top-notch like it's been in Cleveland, like it was with Tampa or Boston. I think it's a really encouraging thing to me that Bloom has been looking not just at his own pipeline. So if I want to give you names, I could go look at <laughs> get names from Cleveland because maybe that's where Serfolio is looking. Um, but hopefully he's not just limiting himself to Cleveland. Maybe he's thinking about Tampa, Boston, L.A., Houston, um, some of the be- Milwaukee, like some of the best player development organizations poaching from those places, Atlanta, making sure you get the best of the best talent around the business. So that's what I'd just be looking at in general is are they going to look, are they going to continue to search far and wide? Um, and it doesn't mean that like if Bloom hires one of his own guys coming up like this, like, oh, like that's bad news. It's like, I, honestly, at this point, any outside voices that aren't like Cardinal centric and haven't just grown up in the Cardinal organization is probably a really good thing. But I just like that Bloom is already setting the precedent that he's not just going to go after his own guys that he knows. So really cool to me. And not saying he didn't know Serfolio before. I don't know. But again, they didn't work together. This is really a lot of like just what he's heard about him, right? And what he studied about him and what he respects about him. So I think it's a really encouraging thing. And the last question today is, um, kind of an interesting spin on what the Cardinals like, kind of like, Hey, are the Cardinals really in the right stage of mind in terms of what they think they should be doing building wise? So, um, here's the question. It's kind of lengthy, but I think reading most of the context is helpful for the response, but they said, I like the idea of investing in prospects, hoping they grow at the major league level, but oftentimes prospects don't work out. Would it be a better strategy um, to have your roster um, sign a lot of productive players on short-term, low-cost contracts with one to five years MLB experience while being flexible with a spot or two on your top, young top prospects can be worked in? With the strategy, I believe you could be competitive while getting valuable playing time for your best prospects. Um, they kind of He kind of said that this is kind of what the Rays do. Trades will happen, but free agency is littered with quality players not making big money. I would love to see the Cardinals take advantage of that. Um, I get where you're going with it and it's not, and like, it's also not totally fair to say, even though I probably subscribe to this way of thinking more, it's not like the only way to build a team is to be player development driven, but I think it definitely is the best way to be, to, um, be cost effective and to be payroll efficient and to, um, not have to spend 350 million to keep your roster really good. Um, I think, where I like where the Cardinals are trending, and I think it's a good principle, is that you build a foundation with young, controllable talent, and then you go out and make the moves that you need to do to put you over the top, rather than what I actually kind of think to this listener's question, that that's kind of what they had done before, which you described, right? Like, obviously, Arnado and Goldie weren't cheap, but like, and like, we wouldn't call Dexter Fowler cheap for what 
they got out of him, but like he like they took the cheap route on the outfielder, right? Like they took the cheap route on Stephen Matz or Cal Gibson or Lance Lynn or trading for Jose Quintana or Jordan Montgomery's. Like they've kind of done that for a while where they kind of keep plugging in holes with middle per like mid production guys that don't cost a lot. And I think what you're alluding to here is like, oh, you can like get the Michael Walker and Seth Lugo. And it's like, yeah, but everyone's chasing that. It's not like, like, no, it's not like when Seth Lugo signed his deal, we're all like, oh, he's going to be a Cy Young candidate this year. Like there's a reason he got the money he got and he worked out. And yes, they should try things like that. But I don't like that being the base of the team. Um, and also the other part of that too. And I think I go back to 2022, like the Cardinals had M- two top three MVP candidates in Goldschmidt and Arenado and the hour pools in their lineup. And it was a top lineup in baseball, but there was something a little bit missing with it. And Brendan Donovan and Lars Newbar both uh, stepped up that year, but they were relying on Donovan, Newbar, but like Gorman, Bader, Carlson, like some of the young guys, the young, to step into significant roles to supplement the roster. And so they had like all their big moves already in place, and then they just needed the young guys to pan out. And they, I mean, they weren't ready fully yet. I mean, Newbar and Donovan produced, but. Like Gorm wasn't ready yet. Carlson really regressed over the stretch. Obviously, it wasn't a great year from DeYoung. Um, I mean, Edmund obviously was great. I was forgetting his name, but um, I think in general, though, like I would rather try and build a strong foundation built on player development. And then when you real like, so say the Cardinals, like JJ Weatherholt works out, right? And now you've got whether Holton win and it works out as in like he's a star like again i'm not trying to put that pressure on him but let's say that happens right you've got your middle of the line you've got your middle of the infield right and say you've got i don't know you've got your third base you've got your catcher you got your left field you got your center field but like you really have holes in right field and first base and you've got a really good rotation but you kind of need another starter that's like another front line type guy then you can go out and make those specific signings knowing that I need to go out and sign a number two starter and spend the adequate money for it. I need to sign a first baseman and, sign, and that can have pop and like is a middle of the order bat. And I can sign a supple, like a supplemental bat right fielder. You can target those specific things, trades and free agent wise, because you've already had young talent that's filling the gaps. You have payroll flexibility and you also have other prospects and other younger players to deal from. When if you kind of go the opposite where you're like, Hey, I want to like have a like build my team through free agency and trade and then have the young players kind of pop up. I think what tends to happen is a lot of them do get blocked because you can't necessarily control that. Like, like you think JJ Weatherholt's gonna be the guy that pops off. So you have second base kind of open for him to step into. But what if he doesn't? But then it's like um Chase Davis is the one who popped off, but you've got three outfielders already because you signed your outfielders. Now Chase Davis is kind of blocked. So it's like, well, do you trade Chase Davis to go get your second baseman? And it's like, well if you had done the opposite order and you just kind of let your guys build up and you're like, Oh, Chase Davis is the one that's good. And whether holds not, then it's like, Oh, like I signed my second baseman, I trade for my second baseman, but I don't have to like use the guy who actually worked out to go do it. Anyways, I just think it's a, I would much rather build youth up and then identify the needs going forward. I don't think it's a, I don't think what you said is a bad idea at all. I just think it can get you into trouble when you're consistently throwing out a lot of those middle of the road deals hoping to kind of build a strong team out of it because like if Dexter Fowler doesn't work out, like it's probably not a good example because all of her, I I mean, like when they signed Fowler, I was so out on it from the very beginning. Um, Trying to think of a good example in recent memory, but like I'd rather them do what they've done with Wilson Contreras and Sonny Gray and go make those kind of signings in the off season or trade for the Goldschmidt or Ronaldo, put them over the top rather than when they traded for Goldschmidt or Ronaldo, they did it out of a place of desperation. They like, really didn't have an offense at all and so like not only like they didn't have the ancillary pieces really i mean they kind of did but like they didn't have the big bats either and so i'd rather you try to develop some of these big pieces and then you go and get those extra pieces put you over the top after so i don't know i mean at the end of the day just build the best team possible right now whichever way you do it you win a world series or you start making the playoffs consistently like none of us are fully going to care how they did it um so appreciate the questions as always like and subscribe help this channel a ton um again we've got some fun guests next week so we're really excited we'll see you guys next time on dealing the cards